Praise the Lord. It's good to be with you all again tonight. Uh, just like Michael said, uh, I didn't have a praise and worship team before. Uh, I've been traveling by myself because uh, as some of you know, some of you don't know, I, I was kind of called out uniquely into the ministry a few years ago to do what I do. And then three years ago, the Lord dropped me into the ministry full time. And uh, when he did that, it happened after my, my first wife, I'd been married to 41 years. And she and my daughter, my 24 year old daughter at the time were killed in a car wreck three years ago. And uh, I never thought I would ever remarry. Uh, under no conditions, I've been asked that question. I thought, no, it's just me and God full time. Uh, I walked in obedience to the Lord and I said, several people asked me in my church where I'm a pastor of the church and they said, Thurman, are you ever gonna remarry? And I said, under only one condition. And that's if God were to speak to me in an audible voice and tell me I was to get married. I said, that's, he'd have to tell me the woman and everything, otherwise I would never remarry. <clears throat> so I pretty well voiced that from the pulpit several times, so I didn't really have any problems. Uh, nobody ever asked me to go with them or anything. <laughs> I never asked anybody out on a date because I didn't expect to ever get married again. But for those of you that don't know, Cheryl, my wife now, we've been married just two months. Uh, uh, she and I are brand new together. And the way this happened on April the 26th, uh, she had a dream. She was a member of my church. She's been a member about two years, just a faithful servant that came to church. And I had no contact with her other than praying with her a few times for different things. And so on April the 26th, the Lord showed her in a dream that she was married to me. She woke up with that dream and she thought, wow, I'm married to my pastor. And she thought it was just a dream, you know. And so what she didn't know, the next morning on the 27th, I rolled over in bed and when I did, I literally, literally, I'm gonna tell you, I literally felt like I put my arm over the body of a woman. It was really supernatural. Uh, I felt that and I, of course, opened my eyes right quick because I thought someone was laying in the bed with me. And when I opened my eyes, I saw Cheryl's face right in my face. Uh, she wasn't a foot from me. And it so startled me that I done a quick double take right quick and I opened my eyes and shut them and opened them again. And of course, there was no one there. It was just a vision. And I'm very grateful that there was no one there. Uh, because that's not exactly the best place for a pastor to wind up in bed with a woman he's not married to. <laughs> but anyway, I would have never done such a thing, never, under no conditions. But I got up and I asked the Lord, I'd been praying and asking the Lord who he wanted me to help me in the ministry. And so that's the way I usually do it. And I got up and I went in the bathroom, washed my face, and I looked in the mirror and I said, Lord, are you trying to tell me that Cheryl is to be the next one to help me in the ministry? What, what are you trying to tell me? And he spoke to me in an audible voice. He said, no, son, Cheryl's going to be your wife. And I thought, she's going to be my wife? So anyway, I went to Bible study that night, <clears throat> taught a two-hour Bible study, and after Bible study was over, it was about seven to nine Bible study, it was about 10 o'clock, and I looked over there, and nearly everybody's gone home. And I looked over there, and there stood Cheryl. I walked over there and I said, I didn't see you at Bible study. She said, I wasn't here. But she said, I had to minister to a woman tonight and I thought I'd come by after I got through with her and just wanted to talk to you a minute. I said, okay. I said, have you ever thought about working with me in the ministry? And she said, I have. I said, would you be interested? She said, I would. I said, well, why don't we go ahead and close up the building and let's drive down here. You follow me in your car to a restaurant and we'll have a cup of tea and we'll talk about this. So she followed me down there. We went inside and we're sitting there and I said, Cheryl, why is it that you would be so willing to give up your career? Because she's a professional singer and songwriter. I said, you know, if you want to work with me, you wouldn't have time for what you do. She said, I know it. I said, so what makes you so willing to give up your career and come to work for me in the ministry? I said, have you had a word from the Lord? She said, I have. 
I said, would you mind sharing it with me? She said, well, it's very personal and it might offend you. And I said, well, go ahead and tell me what it is I'd like to know. I'd be very interested. She said, well, Thurman, I, I, I really, I don't want to offend you, but said, I'll tell you. She said, yesterday morning I had a dream. And in the dream, I was married to you. I said, you were? She said, yes, I was. She said, I hope this doesn't offend you. I said, no, not at all. I said, in fact, this morning, I had a vision. And I saw you, and I saw your face, and I got up and asked the Lord what it meant. And the Lord told me that you were going to be my wife. I said, so how would you like to come to work with me in the ministry full time as my helpmate? And she reached across the table and took my hand and said, I would love it. And so we sat there for about two and a half hours or so and talked about the ministry and things. And after about two and a half hours of talking, I mean, maybe three hours, it was in the wee hours of the morning, and we were in an IHOP restaurant, and so that IHOPs will always be special to me from now on. So anyway, I told her, I said, well, I guess we better go home. So we walk, walked outside. As we walked out, she said her head was kind of swimming, thinking, did this man really ask me to marry him? She said, he did say to be his full-time helpmate, but I didn't hear him mention anything about marriage. So she said, maybe I didn't hear him right. So we walked out to the car, and when we walked up to the car, I opened the door for her, and I said, now that you've agreed to marry me, you reckon it would be okay if I kissed you? And she said, yes. And so we embraced right there beside her car for the first time. And that started a love affair that's going to last a long time. So that's how we came together. And so then we started dating. And of course, I went home, told my son, I said, son, dad's going to get married. He said, dad, I didn't know you were dating anyone. I said, I'm not. I haven't been. He said, Dad, are you telling me you've asked a woman to marry, her, marry you and you haven't even been on a date with her? I said, that's right. I said, I barely held her hand. I said, uh, I asked her to marry me before I held her hand. He said, Dad, that's not the way you do it. I said, well, son, you do what God tells you. And I said, God told me to marry this woman. I said, I don't know a thing about her other than she's been a member of my church, but God told me to marry her. He told her to marry me. So I said, I know we're going to have a blessed life together. I had no idea <clears throat> what the Lord was going to do, but we met and started dating. And as we started dating, we got to know each other a little bit and about our background and her background. And then we decided that we would get married on June the 6th. And when we did that, we realized from the date the Lord spoke to us until we got married was 40 days. I thought that was kind of unique, that 40 days went by. So many things happened in 40 days in the Word of God. So we got married in our church. I'd done the wedding. I married myself. <clears throat> it was kind of unique. That's what she wanted me to do. And so we did it. And it was a unique uh, wedding, but I'm a licensed ordained pastor. And uh, I called the organization I'm licensed with and asked them if I could do that. And they said I could. And so we did that. And so we got married on June the 6th uh, this year. And then almost immediately, as we started going places together, ministering, the Lord began to open doors and areas that we were able to minister to people as a couple that people would never share with me their problems just as myself, especially women. But women began to come to us and they would talk to Cheryl and tell her things and then she would come to me and tell me the women's problems and so we were able to pray for people that intimate things that women would never share with me what they would with her. And so we've been able to see the Lord do some mighty things since then, some mighty wonderful things. And of course, then this song, Sozo, that they sing tonight, that's going to be our new theme song. I have preached on the word Sozo so many times because that's the word that set me free 20 years ago. When I learned what the word Sozo meant, that it means all those things they said in that song, it means not only saved, but it means healed, made whole, delivered, and preserved, those five things. When I learned that word meant all those things, I accepted Jesus Christ as my healer by faith in his word. And for the first time in my life, I have come to that reality by faith. And in 20 years, I've not had a single sick day. I realize that Jesus is a faith God. 
And he expects us to know these things and receive everything by faith. So Cheryl, coming to my church two years, she's heard me preach this kind of stuff. And if she has heard me preach these things, she has sat down the other day and God gave her the words to put together and then within just a few days gave her the music. And for the last two or three weeks, she and I, mostly her, has been over in the studio hours and hours and hours on end putting all this song to music. And I might say right here that this song that she sang tonight, her and her daughter, Christy, that's going to be our theme song, and we have that CD available for people if they want it, if they will call our ministry center. We have that CD available along with many of our teaching tapes. Now, our, we teach, I teach a healing school in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, one in Dallas the second Saturday of every month, and one in Justin the fourth Saturday of every month. And I've been teaching these healing schools going on six years. And I've seen thousands of people healed in these healing schools. So we videotape all of these healing schools. We have ever since the beginning. So we've got all these tapes available. We usually don't put them all out, but we keep eight or ten of those out of the best ones we consider. And we give those away. We give those away and people send donations. And that's how the, our ministry is funded totally by donations. So we don't sell our video and audio tapes. We give them away. But we're going to now have this CD available. If anybody wants this CD with these theme songs and these other two songs their girls are going to sing tonight, all you have to do is call our ministry number, which will be on the screen sometime during the evening. And all you got to do is call them. And we have people there at the ministry center right now. They're there answering phones. If you want any of our information, they will be happy to send you free and postpaid the tapes and the cassettes and videotapes about how to be healed and how to walk with God. We have many of these teachings on audio and videotape. The Lord has blessed us immensely over the years in the number of people we've been able to get healed. You might want to know how in the world did I ever get into this coming from a Southern Baptist background. I was born and raised a Southern Baptist. My mother and dad were Southern Baptists and until about 27 years ago, I was a normal Southern Baptist. <clears throat> I went to church. I believed everything the Baptist doctrine said. I didn't know there was such thing as supernatural manifestations of God. I'd never saw one. I'd never seen a healing. I'd never seen an answer to prayer directly that I knew of. But 27 years ago, the King of the universe, Jesus Christ, came into my study and spoke to me in an audible voice. You can't never be a normal Southern Baptist after you hear an audible voice from the king. In fact, I don't think you could be a normal Pentecostal or anything else. But anyway, it set me on fire, and the Word of God began to take on a whole new meaning to me. I had no idea what the Lord was going to do, but the first time He spoke to me, He spoke to me over my two children. He told me what to do. I was reading in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, when I come to verse 4, that's where he spoke to me. He told me, son, he said, pay attention. I have a message for you in the next few verses. And of course, if everybody would take the Word of God literally and do what it says, we would all raise better families. Because in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, what Moses is telling the children of Israel is what they needed to do if they wanted their children to walk with God. The desire of every human being should be that their children walk with God. It's unfortunate today that we have gotten so far from God in America, most people don't have a clue who God is. And we've even left the Lord's powerful doctrines in the church today that the church does not realize that Jesus Christ is not only the Savior, but He's the healer, He's the deliverer, He's the provider. And we don't know anything. In fact, the average Christian that I come in contact with today, I ask them to quote me, a few verses from God's Word, and people that go to church maybe 10, 15 times a year, maybe they can quote me three or four verses. Some of them can't. Some of them can't quote me a single verse exactly the way it comes out of the Word of God. So there's, you can go down the street and ask people that are Christians what they believe about God. You can ask Christians that are going to church what they believe about abortion, what they believe about all kinds of subjects in the Word of God. 
And it's amazing how many of them have no idea what the Bible says about these subjects. So when you wonder what's going on today and why there's no power in the church, I can tell you, it's because of a lack of knowledge of the Word of God. We don't know what this book says. I was one of those. Although I was a deacon, a Sunday school teacher, I had no knowledge that Jesus was the healer, none. I had never seen Jesus heal anybody. I didn't know how to get my prayers answered. But after the Lord spoke to me 27 years ago, I started reading this book with a new set of eyes. When I began to read this book with a new set of eyes, I began to find wonderful things in here. The Lord was training me. He trained me as I'm reading the book and learning He is a faith God. A couple of years come and went. Now this goes to show you how slow of a learner I am. A couple of years came and went and I was down at Houston on a Monday morning at nine o'clock. And when I got off of an airplane that day, I was, I was a regional engineer for a large corporation, building buildings, designing equipment and all kinds of things. I went down there on a project I was working on. I got off the airplane fully intending to go by our corporate office there at the airport and do some paperwork. Since I was a regional engineer, I covered the whole southern half of the United States, a lot of facilities and responsible for a pretty large budget. So I was going to go by there and do some paperwork and I got thinking about a project I was working on there at the airport and I drove right past the corporate headquarters right out to the job site. I was out there about nine o'clock in the morning in under 20,000 pounds of steel, working on some things, looking at some things, checking some things. And all of a sudden I heard this magnificent voice speak. It said, son, you forgot to do your paperwork this morning. I knew it was the Lord. I said, Lord, you're right, I did. But I said, I'd just like 15 minutes under here. As soon as I finish this, I'll run right back over there and do it. He said, no, son, I want you to go over there and do it right now. Now I am hearing an audible voice, just like somebody standing right there talking to me. I said, okay, Lord. So I crawl out from under there and stand up and I take the second step and the supporting structure holding that 20,000 pounds of steel exploded. 20,000 pounds of steel was laying flat on the ground where I was laying. Of course, as it started falling and, I, and the noise, of course, I normal reactions, you fall, stumble, run, do everything trying to get away, but I was already in safety. When I finally regained myself and stood up, I looked up and I said, Lord, <laughs> that, that verse in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 has just taken on a whole new revelation to me. I am not my own. I am bought with a price. I don't belong to me. My flesh, my soul, my spirit, it don't belong to me. It belongs to the king. When I accepted him as my Lord and Savior, I gave him everything I had. He's mine. I'm his. He can do with me anything he wants to do. Well, that day he saved my life. And he made such an impact on me that day. I looked up and I said, I have no idea what you're going to use me for. But one thing I do know, Lord, you're not through with me. So I said, I'll go anywhere and do anything you tell me. I'll do anything. So the Lord continued to reveal himself to me. And he's teaching me how this book works. After the second time he spoke to me, I'm reading this book and learning a little bit more about faith. And I'm reading the book literally now. I mean, I'm reading it with a new set of eyes. I'm reading this book. I'm spending hours and hours and hours in this book. I used to study it a lot anyway. For the 10 years before the Lord spoke to me, I spent at least five to 15 hours every week reading and studying God's Word. I know to some of you that may not sound like a lot, but to some of you that may sound like an awful lot. Some of you may not have ever spent 15 hours studying the Word of God in your entire life. But some of you may spend a lot more than that. But I was spending five to 15 hours a week, minimum every week studying God's Word for 10 years. I was learning some things. But one night I was on the way down to my mother and dad's house with my wife and my children. I've been reading these powerful promises about where the Lord says, ask anything in my name. I'll do it for you. But you must believe with no doubt in your heart. Like Matthew 17, Matthew 21, Mark 11. Those promises are all over the Word of God. 
I get down to Granbury, Texas about nine o'clock on Friday night in my little 71 Toyota. That's been years ago. It was only a few years old. I'd bought it brand new and it quit running. I pulled into a shopping center there, pulled under a street light, coasted in there. I went out, raised the hood, had a few little tools, took the gas line off. I told my wife, I said, honey, turn the starter over, see if there's any fuel coming out. She spun the starter over, no fuel. Fuel pump had quit. I said, here I am in Granbury at nine o'clock on Friday night with a foreign car with a fuel pump broke. I said, what in the world am I going to do, Lord? Now, how many of you know that we ask God to do things and we don't really believe he's listening? But he's always listening. He's always listening. He spoke to me again right there. He said, son, what did you not believe about my word when I told you to ask anything in my name and I'll do it for you? I looked and I said, well, Lord, yes, you said that. He said, well, I said, okay, Father. I said, Father, in Jesus' name, I ask you to give me enough gas for this car to run 50 miles an hour until I get my wife and children home. I said, tomorrow, I'll put a fuel pump on this car. He's teaching me something about faith. So, the Word of God says, when you ask for something, you must believe with no doubt in your heart. That's difficult, isn't it? If he makes you a promise like that and your heart is not condemning you with sin, if you've got all your sins confessed and you're walking holy before God and you're walking in a love relationship, the Word of God will work for you. So I asked the Father in Jesus' name to give me enough gas, according to Mark 11:23, 23, to provide enough gas for the car to run 50 miles an hour until I got my wife and my children home. And then I told him I'll put a fuel pump on it. So now then I must believe with no doubt in my heart that it's done. Right now, it's done. So I screwed the gas line back in, put the air cleaner back on, slammed the hood, turned and picked up a telephone there, a pay phone, and called mom. I said, mom, we're having a little car trouble, but everything's okay now. We're going to be a little late, but we'll be there. She said, son, are you sure everything's okay? I said, ma'am, everything's fine. We'll be there in a couple hours. So I went and hung the phone up, went around to the back of the car and put the tools back, slammed the trunk, got in, sat down under the steering wheel, reached for the key. My wife said, honey, what are we going to do? I said, we're going home. She said, I thought you said the fuel pump don't work. I said, it doesn't. And I hit the starter. And it started instantly. She looked at me, but she was a very good woman. She didn't say a thing. She just let me and God take care of this. There's a lot of women need to take a lot of examples from godly women. You need to realize some of the times the pressures your husband's under the things he's going through, some of the things he's doing, you don't know, you don't understand the pressures he's under. And for men, it's the same thing. You don't understand your wife. You don't understand the pressure she's in. Sometimes we need to just listen and not talk. So she didn't talk that night. I pulled out of that little area where we were and started up on the highway and the devil spoke to me. I heard his voice. He said, you really don't think God's going to pump gas for an old guy that's done all the bad things you've done? I said, devil, now I'm talking out loud. She's not hearing the devil. I'm hearing him. I said, devil, I'm going to house and I'm not going to doubt. You are not going to get me to doubt the promises of God's word. Now, my wife is hearing me say this, but she does not understand this one-sided conversation. But she doesn't say a word. I get out the edge of town where the speed limit goes up to 55 and I push the throttle down and the car goes up to 50 and 50 is as fast as it will run. It runs 50 on level ground. I go over the top of a mountain, 50, and I go down a hill on the other side at 50. It won't run any faster than 50. I think this is awesome, Lord. Here I am an engineer and it takes a lot more gas for a car to run 50 uphill than it does downhill. Why will it not run but 50 miles an hour? And then the Lord revealed to me through my spirit. He didn't speak to me in an audible voice, but he spoke to me through my spirit. And he said, son, I'm a faith God. And that's exactly what you asked for, enough gas to run 50. And that's exactly what I'm going to give you, just exactly enough to run 50. I learned a great lesson there. Always ask God for what you want, making sure that you do ask him for what you want. 
If you need a healing from God, don't come and ask Him to heal your diabetes if you got arthritis too. Ask Him to heal it all. Believe it's done. Repent of your sins because He is a faith God and He will do exactly what you ask Him to if your sins are all confessed and you're walking in obedience to the Word and you ask in faith, He will do exactly what you ask Him to do. But anyway, that car run two hours that night. Never missed a lick. I got home about 11 o'clock or 11.30, whatever it was, and I was just on fire by the time I got home. Absolutely on fire. I run in telling mother and dad about the magnificent miracle that we had from the Lord. I don't have a clue why God's doing all these things with me, but all I know, He's God, and He does these things, and He's speaking to me. Well, He's training me and teaching me what faith is. He's teaching me how His Word works. He's teaching me Himself, just like He did Paul. And I'm so grateful for those great blessings. But it didn't stop there. I'm continuing to read the Word of God now with a new set of eyes, realizing that this book means exactly what it says to the letter. Exactly. If He says, don't sin, because it'll bring forth death, that's what He meant. If He said, walk holy before me, that's what He meant. So, if He says, do not commit sin, whatever that sin is, if He says, Does not, do not lie, that's what He meant, don't lie. If He says, don't steal, that's what He means. If He says, don't commit adultery, that's what He means. If He says, don't hold a grudge against somebody, unforgiveness, because I will not forgive you, that's what He means. So many people says, as they look at this, they come to me and say, would you pray with me about tithing? I said, absolutely not. I said, you don't need to, anybody to pray for you about tithing. The Word of God says tithe, act on it. Just do what it says. You don't need to ask God what He wants you to do. He made it very clear in His Word what you're to do. I said, you don't have to pray about that. It's just like praying about for God to keep you from telling a lie. No, you don't have to do that. Just act on it. Don't do it. The Word is very clear. It tells you what to do and what not to do. Most of the things we pray and ask God for, He's already told us what to do and what not to do. The problem is we don't read the Word, so we don't know. It's a lack of knowledge of the Word. People go around begging and pleading God to heal them. He told you in His Word all over, starting way back in the book of Exodus under the law, that if we will not sin, if we will walk holy before Him and keep all of His commandments and His statutes, he will take all sickness and disease away from us and we will have none. That's under the law. Then we come to the New Testament and He tells us that He's defeated the forces of darkness. He's defeated the devil. He's healed every one of us at the cross. He's made it a done deal. He said, now then, all of your sins are remitted. I've redeemed you from the curse of the law. Now walk holy before me and you won't never have to be sick. And I've given you power and authority. So when the devil comes to you, he said in James chapter 4, verse 7, he said, If you have submitted yourself to me, submitting yourself to God means walking holy before him, doing what he says. He said, If you submit yourself to me, when the devil comes to you, he said, Take my word and resist him. Resist him with the word of God, the sword of the Spirit. And he says in James chapter 4, verse 7, The devil will leave you. He will flee from you in terror. Most people are like I was the first 45 years of my life. I had no knowledge of how all this worked. So when the devil came upon me to put me to the test, put me down with my back six times, I was down with my back. I mean, what do you do? <laughs> you either call 911 or before 911 came into existence, you let them take you to the hospital and you go to the doctor. I had no idea that Jesus had healed me and bore my pain, removed my sickness and disease on the cross. I hadn't spent enough time in the owner's manual. So I didn't know these things. But after I began to read this book in detail, I began to realize that if I don't sin, if I walk holy before God, this book clearly says the devil cannot touch me. He says that in Proverbs 19, 23. He says that in the Psalms 91. He says that in 1 John 5, 18. So that's at least three witnesses that if I walk holy before God, fear the Lord, and give no place to the evil one, the evil one, which is Satan, cannot touch me. So, if I'm walking holy before God, and the evil one comes to me, 
and tries to put something on me, and he'll do that. He will come to you even when he does not have legal right. Now, this is one of the most devastating things that I ever learned. Whenever I learn that the devil comes to me and puts pain or symptoms upon me, and if I yield to those pains and symptoms, that gives him, the devil, legal right to make me sick because I'm believing him instead of what God's Word says about me. Now, when I begin to learn this, I begin to teach these things in a healing school. And as I, first thing for years, I would go, I mean for years, as I learned these things, the Lord would put somebody in touch with me. I don't have a clue how they found out about me. I didn't advertise. I didn't have a website. I didn't know what a website was. I didn't tell nobody nothing. Just one day somebody would call and said, Thurman, my son's sick or whatever. Would you come over to our house and share with us about God's Word, about healing my son? So I'd take the Bible, what God had shown me. I'd go over there and I'd sit down with them two, three, four, five hours and teach them what God's Word said, building their faith. And then I would pray for them after I'd built their faith. And it was just absolutely amazing what I began to see the Lord do. He began to heal people. He began to take scars off of people's body. He began to take warts off of people's body. I mean, it's, it's amazing the, the things that direct answers to prayer. You know, whenever you, when you're called to the home of a person and they've got a young boy like Philip, 11 years old, and they say, we need a miracle from God. And you think, I wonder why they call me. They said, well, we've heard about you and we've heard about things you teach in the Sunday school class. And so we want a miracle from God. And our pastor in our Baptist church, they don't believe in miracles, but we understand they happen when you pray for people. So we want you to pray for us. So I said, first of all, you got to realize God is a faith God. You got to make sure that all your sins are confessed and that you believe the promises of God. You got to have promises to stand on. So, Faith comes by hearing, Romans 10, 17 says, and hearing and hearing the Word of God. So you take a family, first thing you sit down with them and say, look, the Lord says here in Psalm 66, 18, He will not hear your prayer if you're living in any kind of sin. So if you're living in any kind of sin, any kind of sin, you might as well not pray because it doesn't do any good. God does not hear your prayer. He said, until you repent of your sins and become holy before me with your sins confessed, I will not hear your prayer. So if you want God to hear your prayer, that's the, that's the first place to start. Will he forgive you your sins? Yes, he will. All you got to do is confess them and repent. That means turn from your wicked ways and start doing what the Lord says. So I started teaching these things to people. And just like little Philip, this little boy is 11 years old. And when I got there, they brought little Philip ran in and I looked at him and I asked what they needed and he said, well, I've had these warts all over my body since I was three years old. And I looked at this little guy and he had warts in his eyebrows. He had warts on his eyelids. He had warts in his nose, warts all over, the, all over his face, all over, under his neck and his chin and had them all over the tops and the fingers up underneath the fingernails, all over the palms of his hands. And on the top of the right hand, they had burned two big rows of them off of his right hand, and it left two big huge scars there, long scars, wide ones, and the warts came right back in the scars. He said, I hate it because all the kids at school call me warty. I said, son, I know how people are, even people in the church. People in the church make fun of people. What a shame. We should never live there as Christians. But Unfortunately, we do. <clears throat> so I told the boy, I said, son, there's something you've got to know about God. I've learned there's only one thing that pleases a king, and it's faith after holiness. After you've repented and after your sins are all confessed, your sins of unbelief and everything are all taken care of because, again, the Lord says in Hebrews 3.12, if you have a heart of unbelief, as far as God's concerned, that's an evil heart and that's sin, and he won't hear your prayer. So I said, you've got to get rid of your unbelief. You got to get rid of all sin. So we'd sit there and talk about these promises of God and what sin was. And after two and a half or three hours, I asked the young boy, I said, son, 
now that we've got all of your sins confessed and your mother and dad got all their sins of unforgiveness and, and uh, unbelief and everything else repented of, I said, do you believe that the Jesus I've read to you about in this book can take those warts off of your body? That young man, 11 years old, looked at me and he said, Mr. Scrivener, after what I've heard you read out of this book today, I believe Jesus can do anything. Well, let me tell you, that's the kind of faith we're looking for. That's the kind of faith Jesus is looking for. He loves people of faith. So, I told the young man, I said, now then, son, I want you to turn in your Bible to a magnificent promise in God's Word. Now, this has got to be the reason for what I'm going to tell you is the reason the church does not see more magnificent things is because we must not believe what this book says. If we believe what this book says, we would stop sinning. We would not have all kinds of bad, perverted people standing in the pulpits. We would not have people living together in the church. We would not have all kinds of things that are going on in the church if we believe this book. But when you believe this book and you begin to understand it, a fear of God comes all over you. And I'm telling you, I have a holy reverence or a holy fear for God because I know that all he's got to do is snap his fingers and I'm, I'm gone. And I really would like to live a few more years. I want to serve him. I'm enjoying serving the king with what he's allowed me to do in these later years of my life. I'm so grateful to the king for what he's done. But little Philip, as we talked about this, with all his sins confessed and everything, I said, now, son, I want you to turn to Matthew 18, 19. Now, this promise has been in God's Word for 2,000 years. I didn't know it was there until just a few years ago. What a shame to think that I studied and read this book and something happened. When I would read over these great and mighty promises, it's like there was something over my eyes. Now I know what it was. It was the devil blinding my mind to the truth of the Word of God. And I'm telling you, we underestimate the ability of the devil to blind our minds. But that beast is good at what he does. When Jesus said Satan has deceived the whole world, that's what he means. He has deceived the whole world, all of us, even including the Christians. Matthew 18, 19 makes this awesome statement. Jesus said, again, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything you ask me for, it shall be done for you by my Father which is in heaven. That's a pretty awesome statement. Jesus gave us these great and precious promises so we can become partakers of the divine nature, God's divine nature. Now, in God, there, that's written in 2 Peter chapter 1, by the way. To them that have obtained like precious faith, like Peter. Uh, I don't know very many people today that have like precious faith like Peter did. There needs to be a lot of us in the church, but there's not, unfortunately. We have been, our eyes have been blinded by the God of this world, which is Satan. But this magnificent promise, this is just one of the mighty promises, Peter says, by the knowledge of these promises. By the knowledge of these, we, the body of Christ, shall become partakers of the divine nature of God. And in the divine nature of God, there's no sickness, there's no pain, there's no suffering, there's nothing. But you'll have to learn, just like I did, by faith how to receive these magnificent promises, and you'll have to receive them and act upon them by faith and believe they're real to you with no doubt in your heart. That's the God we serve. So, I had Philip read that magnificent promise. I said, Philip, what do you think about that promise? He said, sir, that promise says if two of us on earth agree about anything we ask him for, it will be done for us by our Father in heaven. So then he means exactly that, Philip. I said, do you believe that? He said, I do. I said, good. I looked over to mother and dad. I said, do you all believe that? And then she said, well, if that's true, we can ask the Lord to take these things off and he'll, they'll go away. I said, that's exactly right. I said, but we got to believe with no doubt in our heart. He says, you must believe with no doubt in your heart for his promises to work. He is a faith God. And he says in James chapter 1, verse 6 and 7, anyone that comes to me and asks me for anything must come and ask in faith nothing wavering. Nothing wavering. You must believe. Now, that's difficult to do. Because the average person, whenever they come and ask God for something, if it's in the area of healing or whatever, they think, well, I, 
I'm going to ask God to do this, but I'm going to go ahead and go to the doctor next week and have these things cut off. Or I'm going to go to the doctor and I'm going to have my surgery. Nope. You didn't believe God at all. That's why you don't get anything. You didn't trust him at all. You were trusting the doctor. I'm telling you, the faith walk is not easy. It's difficult. That's why there's very few people walk in it. It's difficult to trust an invisible God with a tangible physical problem that you have by total faith in his word. But if you will do that, you will get to see the king do some awesome things. I stepped into this world about 20 years ago, and I totally trust him. I've not been to a doctor in 20 years for no reason, and I, will, I won't go to one. I don't care what happens to me. I will not go to a doctor. I'm going to trust Jesus. If Jesus is not able to take care of my problems, then I need a new physician. But he is the best physician in the universe. And I've seen him do creative miracles since I've learned this. I've seen him raise the dead since I've learned this. I have seen the king do some of the most awesome things you can imagine. But we were starting out, and Philip here, a little 11-year-old boy, which had had warts all over his body. I don't even know how many he had, but he had them all over his body, on his hands, his face, several places on his body. But I could see the ones all over his hands and his face and the scars and everything else. So on behalf of Matthew 18, 19, we knelt in the floor there before a righteous and holy God. And I asked the Father in Jesus' name, according to that verse. Now this is another secret. You want to make sure you come to God on behalf of his word. He watches over his word to perform his word. Don't come to him and ask him a shotgun blast. Lord, please do this for me. Find you a verse. Make sure you've got your sins confessed. Make sure you know he's going to do what he said he's going to do. You must ask in faith, nothing wavering. That night we come to God on behalf of his word, Matthew 18, 19. We ask the Lord to remove those warts off of Philip Anthony Wren. I give his complete name before the throne of grace. We made sure all of our sins were confessed. His sins were confessed. And then after we ask, I thank the Lord for doing it. Now this is something that we always need to do when we ask the Lord to do something. We need to thank him for it because we must believe it is already done before we see the results. Now if you say, I'm going to ask the Lord to do that and I hope he's going to do this, Forget it. It's not going to happen for you. He is a faith God, and that does not move the king's hand. Only faith moves his hand. He is a faith God, and that's why a few people that are all the people that come to him and ask him to do something in faith, he does it. But all those that come to him and ask him not in faith, they don't get it. Or somebody comes and asks him something with sin in their life, they don't get it. When you come to the Lord, you must ask in faith, nothing wavering. Because he says so in his word. In James chapter 1, verse 6 and 7, he is very clear. When you ask, you must ask in faith, nothing wavering. He said, for the man that wavers is like a wave of the sea turned and tossed. That man need not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He's very clear that if you don't ask in faith, he will do nothing for you. So as I've learned these principles, I have learned how to stand on these things by faith. So we knelt there on the floor that night, many years ago, with little Philip, and I asked the Father in Jesus' name on behalf of Matthew 18, 19, to remove all of Philip's warts and scars off of his body. Somebody said, give me a break. You think God can take off a scar? Hey, he spoke the world into existence, didn't he? He spoke the stars into existence. He did say in Ephesians 3.20, I can do exceedingly abundantly above all you can even think or imagine according to the power that worketh in you. Your God is just like mine was when I was a young man. I had him in a box about this big. I didn't have a clue who he was. But I've now kicked the sides out of that box. I have no box around God. God is big. He's powerful. He is awesome. He is more than awesome. I have seen God do creative miracles awesome things when I learned how to walk in faith. But this was the beginning. And I'm knelt there on the floor asking the Father in Jesus' name to remove some simple little warts off of a boy's face, hands, and to remove some simple scars that's been put there because they burned two big rows of scars off the top of his hand. I thanked him for doing it. I got up from there and his mother said, when are they going to come off? I said, ma'am, 
That's the only thing God doesn't tell me in his word is when. I said, that's totally up to him. But I said, I'm going to guarantee you on the word of the living God, if you don't doubt in your heart, in a few days to maybe a few weeks at best, Philip will not have a wart or a scar on his body. I guarantee it. Why can I guarantee it? Who guaranteed it to me? Jesus did. If Jesus guaranteed it, he said it will happen. And in Titus chapter 1, verse 2, he says, God cannot lie. If God cannot lie, then what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to believe. So, I believe. When I believed, I started to leave there after mother asked me when they were going to come off, the mother. And I told her I didn't know, but they would come off. I guaranteed it. I said, ma'am, I'm going to guarantee you something else. When I walk out that door, the devil's going to send a demon in here. That demon is going to put a thought in your mind. He's going to say, now you don't really think just because that gray-headed man come in here and prayed a prayer, spoke words into the atmosphere, you don't really think just because he did that, those warts and scars that have been on this boy, the warts have been there for eight years, he's 11 years old, and the scars had been there for a few years, I forget how many years ago they had burned them off, you don't really think those warts and scars are going to go away. I said, but you don't believe that beast. I said, don't listen to him because he will do everything he can to get you to doubt God's word. I said, don't believe him. You go to the Bible, you open your Bible up to Matthew chapter 18, verse 19. You say, devil, I want to show you right here what Jesus said. And you read him the word of God. I said, as long as you'll stay in faith and fight this fight of faith, just like 1 Timothy 6, 12 says, this is the only thing God tells us to fight is the good fight of faith. I said, that means to believe and trust what's written in the Word of God. I said, if you'll trust it with no doubt in your heart, I guarantee that in a few days, Philip will not have a wart or a scar on his body. I walked out the door that Sunday afternoon, walked across the street to church. The next morning, Monday morning, mother wakes up. She goes in to check Philip. She reaches up and gets a hold of his hands and she looks at him and all the warts that were on the ends of Philip's fingers and the ones that were up un underneath his fingernails were all completely gone overnight. Now then when a mother sees a tangible results to an answer of a prayer, it's very difficult for the devil to get through to blind her mind. Now, she's seeing these warts come off. Now if you have cancer or something, it's working inside of you and you can't see it but you still have to believe it's done with no doubt in your heart, regardless of whether you have pain or you do not have pain, you must believe the Word of God. But in mother's case, in this, this mother's case, she's seeing the tangible results. It's very difficult now for the devil to deceive her. So as she's watching these warts go away, three weeks later, this mother walked in, and of course you don't get to see a charismatic mother in a Baptist church very often. But this Sunday morning, this charismatic mother came screaming into church. Now, we might see a few more charismatics in Baptist churches if we got to see a few more answers to prayer. But this mother had never seen an answer like this to prayer. But when she walked in that morning, she was jumping up and down, dancing and praising God. She said, Thurman, look, every wart on Philip's body is gone. There's not a single wart. The only thing left is those two big scars on the top of his right hand. I said, Mother... Whatever you do, don't stop believing God now. I said, next week, the scars will be gone. Just continue to trust Him. Well, the next Sunday when she walked in, she come in there. She was just hysterical. She come over there. She said, Thurman, feel of these little hands. I went over there and looked at Philip's hands. Beautiful little 11-year-old boy. Not a wart or a scar on his body anywhere. The king of the universe took those warts and scars off. As I begin to realize that the, the miracles and the healings and the, the things I was seeing God do became more and more pronounced, the greater and the bolder I came through with the Word of God. When I would get people's sins confessed, I would see the Lord do great and mighty things like this. And then it became so easy to get people healed and to see God do miracles and everything. I thought, wow, well, this is a piece of cake. I wonder why everybody's not doing this. And so I would try to tell people in the church, 
Because at that time, I was still a Baptist, and I was a deacon and a Sunday school teacher, and I wanted them to know what I was learning. But most of them wasn't interested. I couldn't understand that. I, I still don't understand that. I, d I guess I just underestimate the power of the enemy to deceive us as mankind. So, I tried to tell them. A lot of them would not believe me. So, as they would not believe me, they continued to see these mighty miracles happen. So I continued to pray for people and people would come to me and it's amazing that in the church if they had a prayer need instead of going to the pastor they'd come find me and because they knew that God was answering my prayers. So the word began to get out. So people started coming to me with healing that's needing to be healed and everything and I run into some uh, that was real easy to get my prayers answered and then all of a sudden I ran into a few cases that nothing happened. I'd pray over them. I'd do everything. Nothing happened. I thought, Lord, what did I do wrong? I did the same thing here that I did in these other cases. And I said, Lord, nothing happened. I don't understand. This person didn't get well. And so I'd go to the Lord. I'd petition him. I said, Lord, what did I do wrong? Finally, the Lord revealed to me. He spoke to me one day. And he said, son, the reason this one doesn't get healed is because she has a demon. I said, a demon? He said, yes. I said, Lord, you mean we as Christians can have demons? He said, of course. I, now, I'd been asking the Lord over a long period of time, or asking, I'd ask everybody else at first, is it possible for a Christian to have a demon? You ask the average doctor of theology in any seminary, is it possible for a Christian to have a demon living in their flesh? And most of them will tell you no. You go to the average church and ask the average pastor, is it possible for a Christian to have a demon? And they'll say no. But I think about Brother James Robertson. So I'm sure all of you know him. He's on national television all over. He was a very powerful Baptist preacher for years. He spoke to tens of thousands of people. I mean, there's nothing uncommon for him to speak 5,000 a night, 10,000 tomorrow night, and 15,000 the next night. I mean, that's the kind of places where James spoke. He was a well-known preacher. And then he met a man by the name of Milton Green, and he was a carpet cleaner just a little nobody, kind of like I have been. And he was down at a church speaking, and Milton got him off to the side and started talking to him about demons. And he said, James, I believe you got demons. And at that time, he didn't know that James had a lust problem beyond his wildest dreams. Of course, James had been raised up out of wedlock. The devil had all kinds of legal right to him. I've heard him give this testimony himself. So he asked Milton, Milton, do you really think I have demons? And he said, no doubt. You have more demons than anybody I've ever seen in my life. Now, that's not exactly what a Baptist preacher wants to hear. But anyway, Milton Green cast those demons out of James Robertson that day. And as he cast those demons out of him, he became a different man. He knew when he went away from there, he didn't have his lust problem. He didn't have all the problems. He did not understand what had happened. He saw no manifestations of these evil spirits Sometimes they manifest and sometimes they don't. But this is what the Lord showed me why I couldn't get some people healed and delivered because they had demons living inside their flesh. That's quite a shock. So when I learned that demons is our problem, from the Word of God, I went back and began to research this and I found out, yes, this is the problem. Demons. So I started learning and reading in the Word of God what it says about demons. And then I began to realize that if they had legal right to be there, I couldn't get them out. They come in because of curses and because of sin. You take a person that lives in unforgiveness. I had no idea the power of the devil. Of course, and Paul said in 2 Corinthians, he's talking over in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, he talks about the ways of the devil in unforgiveness. He's talking about that. It took me a lot of years to read that to get a hold of what he was meaning there. But he said, if you've forgiven anybody, I forgive them also, because he said, we're not unaware of the devil's ways when it comes to unforgiveness. But I was very unaware of the devil's ways in unforgiveness. But when I learned that when you hold a grudge against anybody for anything, you open a door to the demonic world for Satan to come in to torment not only you, but your family, your bank account, everything you own. Now, I finally got revelation on that as I was reading 
I was reading in Matthew chapter 18, verse 21 through 35. When I read that, Peter and Jesus is walking along one day and Peter asked Jesus a question. He said, Lord, how often should I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? And the Lord says, no, Peter, not seven times, but 70 times seven times in a day. Now that's a lot of times in one day to forgive. But it's so important. The Lord gave him a parable there. He said, Peter, the kingdom of God is like this. He said, there was a servant, there was a king that had servants. And one of the servants owed him 10,000 talents. Now you'll see all kinds of numbers for 10,000 talents from a few million to a few billion. Depends on who translates it. But anyway, it's a very large sum of money. That is an example of mining your debt to the king. That's what we owed him. And that's why we can't pay our debt. But this servant couldn't pay his debt either. He had 10,000, there was 10,000 talents he owed and he could not pay this debt. So by not being able to pay this debt, he came, the king told him, said, it's time you pay me the debt. I want the whole 10,000 talents and I want it right now. And the man says, I can't pay you. It says the man fell down and worshiped him. Now that's the first thing he did right. Everything in the Bible is in it for a purpose. That's the first thing you can do right when you have something that a debt yourself with the Lord, you can fall down and worship him and come before him. And he will do the same thing to you he did for this guy. This guy owed 10,000 talents and he fell down and worshiped the Lord and said, Lord, be patient with me and I will pay you all that I owe you. And the Lord says, that's okay. Because you've asked me, I'm going to forgive you that whole huge debt. You don't owe me nothing. Boy, what a, what a blessing to have a 10,000 talent debt forgiven just that easy. So it said the man went out and he was happy and he found a brother that owed him 100 denarii. Now 100 denarii is a very small amount of money. It's just pocket change compared to 10,000 talents. So he goes up and he grabs this other man by the nap of the neck and begins to shake him. And the man falls on his knees and he says, pay me the 100 denarii that you owe me. And he said, I will but be patient with me. I don't have it right now. I will pay you. And the guy that had just been forgiven 10,000 talents said, no, I will not be patient with you. I want it now. And because you can't pay, I'm going to throw you in jail. So he had the man thrown in jail. It says some of the other servants saw what happened. So it says they came and told the king, said that servant you forgave that huge debt, he would not forgive a measly little hundred denarii. So the king says, call that wicked servant in. Wow. He called this guy a wicked servant. He said, call that wicked servant in and bring him in here. So they went and got him. They brought him in, put him before the king. And the king said, you wicked servant, did I not forgive you that huge debt? Now then, because you did not forgive him that huge debt, neither will I forgive you. And he says, because you did not forgive and because you could not pay, I'm going to sell you and your wife and your children and your lands and all that you own is going to go to pay the debt. Right there is a very insignificant little statement we think. But what that means is if you're the head of the household or the mother of the household, and either one of you, man or woman, has an unforgiveness toward anyone and you will not forgive it, you are turning yourself and your spouse and your children and your lands and everything that you own over to the tormenting spirits. The Lord clearly said there, now because you have not forgiven, neither will I forgive you. And I'm going to turn you over to the tortures, the tormentors. You have any idea who that is? That's the devil and his demons. And he says, and you shall not get out until you pay me every penny you owe me. When you look at that, the next verse will literally blow your socks off. Verse 35. Verse 35, Jesus said, Peter, this is the way my heavenly father will do each of you if you do not forgive your brothers from your heart. Think about that. If a man and a woman's married, when the two get married, they become one. 
if either one of them holds a grudge against anybody, you're turning your entire family, including your spouse, and every asset you have over to the tormentors, the devil. Since I've learned that principle and the way that works, I have been able to get a many a child set free. I've been able to get a many a child healed. I've been able to get a many a man or a woman, even the one that was, did not have their unforgiveness. I've seen men on their deathbeds because their wives had unforgiveness in their heart towards someone else. I've seen it both ways. I've seen children that were afflicted. And I've, I've seen it, when I learned this, I began to make these audio and video tapes. And I began to make these tapes so people could see these things. And I thought, Lord, everybody needs to know and understand what I've learned about this book. So, Lord, I'm not even going to sell these things. I'm going to give them away. I said, I want people to know what you've revealed to me. So that's why I make all these audio and video teachings. That's why I give them away, because I want you to know what I have learned, because it has changed the lives of thousands of people. And I, I do that. All these audio and video teachings that I've made over the years, with all these teachings that I've learned, they're in my ministry center, free and postpaid if you want them. All you got to do is call and we'll send them to you. We want you to learn. We want you to walk in divine health like I've learned to walk. There's a young man came to me one day. He walked into my office. A guy looked like warmed over death. I said, what's wrong with you, son? He said, Mr. Scrivener, I hadn't had any sleep in a few days. I said, why not? He said, well, my little four-year-old daughter is down with a seizure and she's got 104 temperature and nothing the doctors can do will help her. I said, son, are you a Christian? He said, yes, I am. I said, are you going to church? He said, yes, I am. I said, are you tithing? He said, yes, I am. I said, do you hold any grudges against anybody? He said, no, sir. I said, so you consider yourself walking in love? He said, well, yes, sir. I said, then it's got to be your wife. I said, go, let's go contact your wife. We went to see his wife, and his wife, he asked her, he said, honey, do you have a grudge against anybody? She said, you know, I don't understand what's going on. He said, what do you mean? She said, this morning my aunt came by and said, you know, you've been holding a grudge against cousin so-and-so too long. You need to forgive them. And she said, then at about noon, grandpa came by and said, you know, you've been holding a grudge against cousin so-and-so too long. You need to forgive him. I thought to myself right there, I thought, Lord, you are working. You've sent two people by this home already to get this woman's sin confessed, and she's not hearing you. It's amazing what God sends by to tell us something, and we don't hear him. He says to him that has ears, let him hear. Well, she wasn't hearing. So anyway, and she said, now you're asking me if I have a grudge. She said, yes, I have an unforgiveness toward cousin so-and-so. I told him, I said, ma'am, that's what's wrong. That's what's opened the door to the devil to come in and torment this little four-year-old girl of yours. I said, that's why the doctors can't do anything because a devil is sent there and he sent her by legal right. You have opened the door to the tormenting spirits to come to your baby and he has jumped in and he has put this girl in a seizure and bound this little girl up. I said, you must forgive that boy. You must get right with him or we will not be able to get your baby healed. So she had never heard anything like this, but I told her, I said, don't feel you know, like the Lone Ranger, because I said until just a few years ago, I'd never heard anything like this either. But I said, it's written in God's Word. Showed it to him. So she went and confessed her sin, went over and got right with her cousin, and came back, and she said, well, it's all taken care of. I said, okay. I took this little 24, 25-year-old young man and his wife. I said, now let's go to the room where your daughter is. They went up there, and the nurse had just checked her. She had a, still had a 104-degree temperature, bound up in a seizure, bound by a demon. Now then the legal right of the demon has been removed. But before I learned about demons, I could have prayed for that little girl all day long and never saw her get healed. And this is what I had run into. I'd been praying for people that are getting healed. I saw warts go away. I saw scars go away. I began to see God do awesome things. And now then you pray for people and nothing happens. When the Lord told me it was a demon, and I had to get the sin confessed to take away the devil's legal right. And I began to research the scriptures and found this to be written in the Word of God. Well, that night when I got that little girl's sins confessed and we went to that room, I told that young man, I said, young man, 
You're a young man, and I know you've been in church, but I know you have no knowledge of God's mighty Word and His power. I said, but I'm going to tell you exactly what scriptures to use. I said, number one, I want you to voice out loud that so the devil can hear it. Of course, he already knows that you and your wife have gotten right with this cousin, and there is no longer an unforgiveness between you or your wife and her cousin, and the devil's legal rights been removed. So they voiced that. I said, now then, I want you to voice Luke chapter 10, verse 19 and 20. I had him turn to Luke 10, 19 and 20. And Luke 10, 19 and 20 makes this statement. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions, Satan and his demons. All power is given to you over them. They shall in no wise hurt you. Be not thankful that those evil spirits have to be subject unto you, but rather be thankful that your name's written in heaven. So, as that young man quoted that verse over the bed of his little daughter, I said, this will show the devil that you know your power and your authority and that he has to be subject to you. I said, now then, that the sin has been forgiven, the legal right of the beast, the devil, has been removed. I said, so now then we can cast him out. I said, now then I want you to turn in your Bible to Mark chapter 16, verse 17 and 18. And I want you to read those two verses out loud. He turned over there and Jesus said in Luke, in Mark 16, 17, he said, and these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name, the name of Jesus, you shall drive out demons or devils. And then down at the bottom of verse 18, he says, and you shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. He quoted that verse. I said, now then walk over and lay your hands on that little girl, your daughter. You're the spiritual authority in the home. Nobody has more authority over that little girl than you do. I said, walk up there and put your hands on that baby and tell that devil he has no more legal claim to your baby and command him in the name of Jesus boldly to come out of your baby and go to the pit and to never return in Jesus' name. And that young boy did that with all of the enthusiasm he had, which wasn't a great deal. But I'm telling you, that devil left and that little girl was instantly healed right before his very eyes. When that devil left, that little girl came loose. She began to able, be able to move. She got up off the bed. She began to walk around. And a nurse came in and checked her. She said, what's happened? And she checked her temperature, and it was 98.6. It was not 104. Let me tell you, when you get a hold of what's going on on this earth, when you get a hold of the invisible realms of the demonic forces, you begin to understand why we do what we do. You'll begin to understand that when you learn and read God's Word and you learn the promises about who you are and what you can do, then you'll begin to understand who it is that's coming and talking to you when a thought comes to your mind and says, go ahead and steal that. Nobody will ever know. Go ahead and do something evil to that person. Nobody will ever know. Go ahead and go to bed with that boy out of wedlock. Nobody will ever know. That's the devil talking to you. That's certainly not God. And when you yield to that voice, that's contrary to the Word of God, you open a door to the demonic world and that devil comes in to torment you and make you sick. When you get a hold of what's going on and these three voices that are speaking to us, number one, your brain receives input from three sources. It took me most of a lifetime to learn this. Number one, you are trained by your five physical senses and your five physical senses give you an input to your brain. Number two, you can hear from the devil directly from the outside. The devil can put a thought right into your head and make it think, make you think it's your own thought. He is so sly in the way he does things. He'll put thoughts in your mind and he'll do it exactly at the right moment. He'll take a man and a woman and all of a sudden they've had a, maybe both of them had a hard day. They're both tired. They come together in the afternoon when they should be coming together to have an evening meal together to love each other. And one of them will walk in and one of them will make a derogatory statement toward the other one. And when they do, immediately the devil will say, just listen to what that, that guy said to you. Let's think how hard you've worked today. He doesn't re appreciate you or respect you or love you at all. And you'll listen to that thought and you'll jump right back down his throat. And when you do, then the devil will come at him and he'll put a thought in his mind and say, look at her. She doesn't appreciate you. Just tell her how it happens. And first thing you know, you got a war on your hands. And then you got two people that are against each other 
And then you got people that have separation, divorces, and everything else. Or you'll have a child. The child will go out. Somebody will say, why don't you just try this cigarette? And you say, no, my mother and daddy told me not to smoke. And they say, I'll just go ahead. If you haven't tried it, don't knock it. It's good. Try it. Of course, there's a little voice in your head saying, go ahead. Be one of the guys. You're listening to the wrong voice. So, when you listen to the wrong voice, you go wrong. Now, if you don't know how to discern these spirits, and the only place you can learn this is in the Word of God. So, when you don't know how to discern the spirit that's talking to you, you will listen to the wrong voice. So, there's two voices you'll hear. Number one, yourself will be communicating with your brain. And it's a, we get inputs from our five physical senses to the brain. Or a devil or a demon will communicate with our mind, and he'll always tell us to do what's wrong. Or the third source will be God that'll speaking through your spirit, and your spirit will be communicating with your mind, and some people call that conscience or intuition or whatever, but that is the Spirit of God speaking to your spirit, which is communicating with your mind that's putting thoughts in your mind. And that's the way we hear God most of the time. You hear Him through the Word, and you hear Him through your spirit, or once in a while He'll speak to you in that audible voice. When He speaks to you in that authoritative audible voice, if you've never heard that, and I know many of you people that are listening to us tonight have heard that voice. I was in a big church the other day speaking to a group of pastors, and there was about a hundred of them there, leaders and everything, and I asked the question, how many of you have ever heard the authoritative, audible voice of God? And out of that group of 80 or 100 men and women, at least two-thirds of them held up their hand. They had heard that authoritative, audible voice of God. God does communicate with His people. If you will seek Him and walk holy before Him, He will communicate with you. Now then, if you will do what the Lord says, if you will read the Scripture, you'll walk holy before Him, and you'll learn to discern these spirits and listen to the right voice, you will not go wrong. But the only way you can learn how to discern the spirits that are out here talking to you is to read this book and meditate on this book literally day and night. When you do this, then you will learn how to discern the proper spirits, and you won't go the wrong direction. As you sit here with God's Word and you understand that unforgiveness is the most powerful thing that there is that I know of that gives the devil legal right to the greatest number of people. If everybody understood unforgiveness in the light that I understand it, and I know many people do because I've heard many men preach on it the same way I do, that not only the Lord says, if you will not forgive your brothers from your heart, He says, I will not forgive you. If God does not forgive you for your sins, you're not going to get into heaven. Whatever the devil does to you and whatever somebody else does to you, is it worth holding a grudge against them and spending eternity in hell for what they did to you? I don't think so. If you could go to hell and spend five or ten seconds there, I guarantee when you come back, you would have no problem forgiving anybody their sins. There would be no problem with you forgiving. And if you learned that you as a parent are going to have an unforgiveness in your heart and it's going to give legal right to the devil, to your spouse, to kill them, that's a sad thing. And I've seen that many times. I've seen men and women that one of them have unforgiveness and the other one's dying. And I prayed over that person and prayed and rebuked the devil and done everything and nothing happened. And then when I would finally find out the other spouse is the one that has unforgiveness, when I get them to repent, a powerful case just a few years ago, a man, a deacon in a Baptist church, he'd been sick for years and now he's down and he burned a hole in his colon with radiation and he didn't know how to walk by faith, didn't have a clue how to walk by faith. So he went to the doctor like nearly everybody does. After they killed him, technically, they sent him home to die. And then I found out that the man's problem was unforgiveness through his wife. She had unforgiveness toward all kinds of people. When we got her to confess her sins, 
this man that was on his deathbed, which was sent home to die, terminal, after using James 5, 14, 15, anointing him with oil and praying the prayer of faith over him, the man was completely healed in one week. And today, years later, that man is still alive today. So, it's very, very, very important to make sure you hold no grudges against anyone. That will give the enemy legal right to you and your spouse. I was asked the question, if she's the one who had the unforgiveness, why in the world did the devil hit the man? Well, when I looked at her life, the man was a Baptist deacon. He was a man that loved God. He's a man that loved to teach the Word of God. He's a man that loved to serve the Lord and go to church. But his wife, she was just a traditional Christian. She went to church. She didn't serve. She didn't teach Bible study. She didn't do anything. She didn't win people to Jesus. She was just there. So naturally, the devil's not going to hit her because she's no threat to his kingdom. So once he got legal claim to her husband, he was the threat. So he was going to take him out. And he almost had him tuck out until I found out the problem. I got the woman to confess her sins. And after she confessed her sins, then after the prayer of faith, the father, the man, was healed in one week. I've seen that happen over and over and over. Now then, if you come to the Lord for healing and you have unforgiveness or your mate has unforgiveness towards someone, it's virtually impossible for you to be healed. You must repent of your sins first. But if you have any kind of sin in your life, I'll tell you a story about a young lady. It's just June, uh, January the 8th this year. There's a precious, beautiful young woman. I don't know how old she is. Uh, I, I really hate to say, but I, she must be close to 45 or 50 years old, I guess. I don't know. She goes to my church, and she had been down with her back for 30 years. She'd been to a chiropractor one to five times a week for the last 23 years and had never been in those 23 to 30 years without pain. She came to me and she said, Mr. Scrivener, she'd come to a healing school. She said, I had been prayed over by at least 100 people and nothing's ever happened. I said, ma'am, the reason nothing's happened because you've not repented of your sins and then you've never can, had anybody pray for you in faith. I said, what was your sin? She said, well, after hearing you teach the Word of God this afternoon at a healing school, I know what happened. She said, 30 years ago, I was living with a young man out of wedlock. And she said, I had a car wreck during that time, and that's when I got this whiplash. I said, that's what gives the devil legal right to you. I said, are you willing to confess that is sin? I said, you're not still living there, are you? She said, oh, no. She said, I haven't lived with that man for years. But she said, I did for a while. And she said, while I was living with him, I was hurt in a car wreck. And I said, that's when you opened the door. You open the door through sexual immorality and that give the devil legal right to hit you and that give him legal right to stay in your back all these years. I said, so if you'll repent, tell the Lord you're sorry, tell him you'll never commit sexual immorality again, I'll lay hands on you according to Mark 16, 17 and 18 and rebuke this devil and command him to leave. And I said, the Lord will heal you. On January the 8th, I reached up and laid my hands on this beautiful young woman and rebuked the devil and commanded him to leave and instantly the woman was healed. She still goes to my church. Every Sunday she's there. Virtually every Tuesday night at Bible study she's there. I talked to her the other day. I said, young lady, I said, you won't sin anymore, will you? She said, I guarantee I won't sin no more. She said, nobody ever taught me these things. But she said, now that I've been coming over here to the Living Savior Ministries, I've learned what brings sickness and disease. And she said, I suffered with pain in my back for 30 years because of sin. And she said, no more. She said, I'm going to walk holy before God. Let me tell you, the church is sick and afflicted today for several reasons. Number one, they don't seek God and put Him first. They put Him on a back burner. They put Him last instead of first. Number one, God says, I'm a jealous God and you must put me first, not last. So if you'll put Him first and read His Word every day, worship Him and praise Him and thank Him for who He is. If you will do that, then the Lord will be right there and you will have made Him the Most High God your dwelling place. I said, so stay there with Him. Read His Word. Worship Him. Praise Him. Stay in His Word every day. Make sure you're knowing who He is. You're walking holy before Him. You're making Him your Lord and your God. And you're 
praise, praising him every morning when you wake up. You praise him. You thank him for who he is. Don't ever take a bite of food without thanking him and praising him for it. Praise him for everything. Walk holy in obedience. Share Jesus with people everywhere you go. Share the word of God with people. Learn how to lead people to Jesus. If you say, well, I could never witness like that. Well, then learn how to do something for the kingdom. Learn how to produce fruit. Learn how to take something to someone that is sick. Learn how to pray the prayer of faith. Learn how to do something to produce fruit for the kingdom of God. Whatever you do, learn how to do things for the kingdom of God. Now, I'm telling you that all these, all these years, the things I'm teaching you tonight is just a little tiny segment about what I've learned about how to walk in divine health and healing. It's such a vast subject. That's why that we have videotaped everything we've done for the last six years. And that's why we make all these audio and videotapes. And like I said, if you'll call that number that's been on the screen, if you'll call our ministry, we will be happy to send you these things free and postpaid. And if you would even like a copy of our new musical CD, we would be happy to send that to you because that song that Cheryl's written about Sozo Me Lord, that song has everything in it that'll teach you how to walk in divine health. That word Sozo is what set me free 20 years ago. That taught me how to become a partaker of the divine nature of God. So if you will do what the Word of God says, if you'll believe Him and you're sick, if you'll repent for your unbelief. I have had more people in my church healed this year that were magnificent people that go to church, that worship the Lord, that serve Him, that praise Him and thank Him. And even my secretary back at my minister center, her husband, which is a prophet of God, he had been down in his back for two years. He took two of the tapes that I had made, listened to those two tapes, two 90-minute tapes, and there's so much of the Word of God in those two tapes. At the end of those two tapes, driving down the road in his car, he looked up and he said, Lord, everything that man said on those two tapes is your word. He said, why have I been down in my back for the last two years? And he said, the Lord spoke to me. And he said, because of your unbelief of my promises. He said, Lord, I repent of my unbelief. And he said, Thurman, I didn't even have to pray, ask God to heal me or nothing. As soon as I said, Lord, I repent for my unbelief, he said, I was instantly healed. Instantly healed. Isn't that amazing? I had another lady this last year that was hurt in a whiplash in a car accident in November. And, and come uh, April, she was still down with her back. And so I was down there in that place teaching the Word of God. And as I was teaching about these great and awesome promises, the Bible is full of these promises. If you're walking in obedience to His Word, but how many people do I know that's walking in obedience to His Word, walking wholly before Him, but yet still living in unbelief of the promises of God? If you are living in unbelief of the promises of God, that is sin. Romans 14, 23 says, anything that's not of faith is sin. Anything that's not of faith or according to the Word of God is sin. So we need to make sure that we're walking holy before God. You cannot know what His promises are if you haven't read the book. And you've got to read the book over and over and over. You can't just read it one time. I have read some of this book hundreds of times. And still, when I reread it, I'll get a new revelation. So I know you'll have to study the book. When the Lord says in the Word, you must meditate on the book day and night. Day and night. If you will do that, these promises will become a revelation to you. And then, as you see these promises, I will bring these promises out to you on these audio and video tapes for you. So you can sit there and look at them and you can say, wow, God made me those promises. Those promises are for me. So Lord, I come to you, number one, I repent of my sin of unbelief. I repent of whatever sin I've been living in. Lord, I done this or I done that. I was lying, I was cheating, I was living in adultery or whatever I was doing, I repent 
and I turn from my wicked ways. And Lord, I'll never do that again because it says sin, when it is fully matured, brings forth death. You don't want to go there unless you're ready to die. Repent of your sins. The Lord will forgive you your sins. And when you re repent and ask forgiveness, He will forgive you. And then you must learn how to pray a prayer of faith and believe it's done. When you pray the prayer of faith or somebody prays the prayer of faith with you, you must believe you have received your healing with no doubt in your heart and then go and begin to thank the Lord and praise Him for your complete healing. And if you do that, the King of the universe will heal you every time, I guarantee.